immigration, uh, mostly, oh, wow. they're yeah. Eastern European Jews, but mm -hmm. mostly from Russia, to Ellington. And this happened around the turn of the century, um, very late 1800s, early 1900s. And this is Christopher Biggs, he is our presenter, and our researcher is Steve Pukes. Um, he did all the research on this with the help of Barbara McCleary. Um, it's a really interesting program, I'm sure you're going to like it. The other thing I just wanted to say is there's some flyers up front and a signing if you'd like to get on our email list and we will inform you of talks and programs we're having. There's a flyer about the Historical Society and um, on April 20th, it's Ellington's Earth Day celebration and that's when we begin our uh, 2024 exhibit. We're really excited, working hard on it and it's it happened in Ellington, believe it or not. And it's all these quirky stories from an 1800s hot air balloon ride to bouncing pickles to funky murders and weird things. So it's, um, it's going to be a good one. So I'll give you Chris. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning, I should say. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come here to speak on the uh, Jewish heritage in Ellington. Um, I have the good fortune to present the bulk of the great research that Stephen did, so uh, he will be joining me uh, to walk through a few of the stories. But this is a really remarkable um, story of Jewish heritage in the Ellington community, and. Um, we have quite, quite, a, quite a bit of material to um, cover today. We also, I know, have some of the family members that we'll be talking about. Um, so feel free to uh, raise your hand and say we didn't pronounce the name correctly. Or you have a little of a different story. I'd love to be able to share more stories than just what we, what we have been able to pull together. Um, my parents are in the audience, so try to be nice to me. <laughs> so, so, um, but anyway, so uh, we'll begin with um, where we began. Um, so when Stephen, myself, Barbara, and Diane sat down and started to talk about how do we approach Jewish heritage and the, the story in our town, we, we really had a sketch of a few people. Um, but we really wanted to dig deep. And so we, we kind of used this as like a, uh, as a visual cue to what, where we started, is that there were just silhouettes of history and silhouettes of individuals that we wanted to start to build a more comprehensive story. We had pictures here or there, we had stories, uh, but we hadn't really put it all together to build that narrative that would just take us from the very first time somebody came into this, into this community to where it is today. And it really became a, a journey of passion for our good friend Stephen, who will be <laughs> will will we'll be taking you through a few of the family, and um, so with, without further ado, they, we will be talking about some of these individuals: Sam, Samuel Rosenberg, Aaron Dopkin, Joe Cohen, and the Berm Bermans. But they're just to be they're just a few of the stories that we'll be sharing today. Um, but let's let's ground this whole story in why did we see immigration coming to? United States and then ultimately to Ellington and so we wanted to take you back to Russia well Central Central Europe in the 1800s and uh, there's a place in Europe at that time it's called the Pale and it's really kind of an unfortunate situation but the Jewish families um, and Jewish people in Europe are really forced by the Russian the Russian Tsar to live in this certain area. Um, and you can read here, just life in the pale for most was economically bleak. Most people relied on small service or artisan work that could not be supported, could, that could not support the number of inhabitants which resulted in immigration, especially in the 19th century. So it's really, you start to see real discrimination and you see this community having to cluster in this area of Europe. Um, it gets worse though in 1881. And, <laughs> What happens is Tsar Alexander II, um, who's an interesting character in history because at the time, he's obviously the emperor of all of this land where the Jews, Jews are living and the Russians are living. And he's actually somewhat of a reformist, but there's a, a, basically an anarchy movement that's happening throughout Europe. And he's, he's assassinated in St. Petersburg. And 
it's, it's a really interesting story. I'll just tell you quickly because it's one of the first examples of a suicide bombing. Um, these, there are three bombers that are basically, if you're familiar with the story of the Archduke uh, assassination, very similar. He's traveling back to the Winter Palace and his, his, um, his sled, he's on a sled, is attacked. And a bomber throws a bomb and it, uh, it stops the sled. He's not hurt. He gets out to see what's going on and another bomber comes up. And it's at that moment that he's he's basically mortally injured. What happens after that is an interesting because one of the one of the third bomber that's there is to, is planning to throw throw the bomb, but he sees what's happened, and he actually rushes to the Russia, Russian Tsar's aid. So a very interesting moment, and then he's he's arrested, and from that quickly unravels who were some of the conspirators. Unfortunately. What happens is one of the conspirators is this woman here um, in the center. Um, her name, I do not know how to pronounce that, but I've seen other pronunciations where it's Helsa Hels um, Gelfman. She's a Jewish woman who's put on trial. And from that moment, she's, she's on put on trial with six other individuals. And she, being Jewish, is seen as like one of the reasons why this czar has been killed is because of Jewish anarchists. So they, they really then start to zero in and say the problem is really the Jewish people, not, not just this anarchy movement. And so she's put on trial. Six, six are uh, tried and executed. She's actually pregnant at the time. And um, according to Russian Orthodox uh, religion, they can't execute her because she has a baby in, in her body. So what happens is Tsar Nicholas II, who's Tsar, Tsar Alexander II's son, says, oh, don't worry, she can deliver the baby. I'll send over my personal medics to help deliver this baby. So obviously, things do not work out well for her, and she dies shortly after the pregnancy, and then they, uh, the baby disappears to history. There's some rumors that the baby's put to death as well. But what does this do? Why am I saying all this? Is that... It's a horrific experience that then leads Tsar Nicholas II to go on this just rampage against the Jew Jewish people. And I'm sure you've heard of these before, but the pogroms start. And these are just basically uh, a, an early, a best example of it, if you've never heard of it, is the, the Holocaust against the Jews in, um, in, in the Pale specifically. And what we like about this picture, because it's a horrific picture, but it shows you the situation that the Jewish people were facing, is you can see people here that are persecuting this Jewish man. So right here above the 18, 1882 is a police officer doing nothing. <clears throat> and so this is what they were facing, is this horrific, horrific persecution in the 1800s, which is, if this is the first time you've heard this. I will tell you during this research, this is the first time I learned about this, and I, I was just shocked to see the level of violence that they experienced at that time. Across the pond, as they like to say, in the United States, Theodore Roosevelt hears what's going on, and he's one of the, one of the first U.S. presidents to really say, look, we need to help these people. And so he, this is a great political illustration, just saying, that basically, look, you have to stop what you're doing, Russia, and you need to, you know, we're going to open our arms to the Jewish population. So between the years <laughs> 1881 and 1915, we see 1.5 million uh, Jewish immigrants come to the United States. And I, I just really love this, this illustration here where you can see the open arms of Americans welcoming the Jewish people to this country. So where are they coming from? So a lot of the people that we'll be talking about again today are coming from the Pale, but they're coming from ports all over Europe. Um, and you'll say, it's actually pretty cool. We actually have some of the ships, pictures of some of the ships of the people that came, but from Liverpool, from Germany. Um, and this is actually interesting too, is that the Germans at this time are very helpful to the Jewish people, which is strange from what we know about the Germans in the 1930s and the 40s. But, Ports like Hamburg are where people are, are coming, for, uh, are leaving from to come to the United States. <clears throat> so the arrival, 
we all know about Ellis Island. We know all the stress that comes with that, that experience. Well, there's something interesting that's happening with the Jewish people when they come over. They know that there's this helping hand that's there to help them come together, come to this country, and um, get settled. And what it is, again, back to the German connection, is there's this German, basically, uh, his name is Baron, and, and he really is, he's a titan in the railroad industry. So Baron de, de Hirsch basically has set up this Jewish agricultural society to help Jew, Jewish people come to the United States and get them settled. So it's a, uh, it, the Jewish agriculture culture was chartered in New York in, in the 1900s. Its original purpose was to provide agriculture tra training as free farmers on their own soil to Jewish immigrants coming to America from Europe. So you have this moment now where a lot of what you'll see in the story as we, we tell it today is this Jewish agricultural society is instrumental in setting and helping Jewish people from the pale, from Europe, come here and get settled specifically in Ellington for our story today. Any questions so far before I get, uh, get into, now we're going to start to get into the nitty gritty of the Ellington story. Is there any questions on how we got to where we are today? Mm -hmm. So a lot of this new to you as well. The, the, yeah, it's very interesting. So what we have here is just a picture of the, the Agricultural Aid Society. So this is a, a photo of all these gentlemen in, your, in, in New York City that are there, they're agents to help these people as they come into the, into the um, country. And what is their impact? 1900, there were 200 Jewish farming families in the United States. By 1933, there were over 100,000 Jews who, uh, who delivered their livelihood in whole or part from the farm. This is an amazing story if you think about it, especially 1933, when you think about what's happening in Europe. If those families didn't get out, where would they be at that moment? So this, is, this, this group of gentlemen right here and this man here really are... Are, are important people in just human civilization, and, and they shouldn't be forgotten for the work that they did to help so many people. So, what's interesting too, as we tell the story, is we're going from Europe to New York to now we're getting closer to Connecticut. And so, what you, what we found is this is really interesting. By 1913, there's an article in the Hartford Current that says there are a large number of Hebrew farmers in Colchester, and especially large number in Ellington who are doing good work along the lines of husbandry, tobacco, raise, raising milk production, and truck farming. So what you have is that these guys are really bringing it to Connecticut, and now our story is going to take shape with the people from Ellington. Here's just an example of their impact. Here's a, Steve found this. This is a list of mortgages that they were able to offer to Ellington uh, farmers. Um, there are 36 mor mortgages on this page between the uh, dates of September 29, 1906 to May 29, 1919, with the average loan value being about $500. So it's a lot of money at that time, and it's really helping settle these people in the community. The man that does is really instrumental going from the New York to the Connecticut is this man named Samuel Becker. Now, he's not an Ellington person. He's living in Hartford. But what he, what he does, and I love when Steve tells this story because he's got it down because I can just visualize it. He's got an automobile. They get to him, and he drives them out to Ellington, to the, you know, the, to the Connecticut Valley, and starts showing them the farmland and talking about the potential and like raising that excitement and helping bring the loan idea with the possibility of the human aspect of it <clears throat> together. So he's just this remarkable... Uh, Person and you, this this idea of send him to Becker. You'll hear that a couple times throughout this this presentation. So it's get to New York, send him to Becker, and then we're going to get we're going to get you settled in 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 Ellington, Colchester, or some community around um, around local area. So here's a photo, and we're going we're gonna, to we'll walk through this. So of what we're we're really describing as the founding fathers of Ellington's Jewish community. So we have. Um, we have Joseph Berment is the gentleman with the, the glasses. Um, Samuel Rosenberg, who will be the first pick, uh, person we'll be talking about today, is in the middle. Um, and we have the Lavitz as well. Um, this gentleman here, Samuel, uh, Steve, how do you pronounce that? Kostolevsky. Kostolevsky. So 
I, I have like a little bit of a Midwestern meets <laughs> New England, and so the names like that are just are, are often difficult for me. So he's yeah, the representative. Yeah. He's standing proudly with the the founding founding members. So because if you remember earlier, and I should have mentioned this, uh, Becker, if you saw, he, is, he didn't live that long. He, he had a short but mighty life as well. And so Samuel comes along, and he's he's involved in helping settle the the, the Jewish people in the town. So. Um, with that said, we're going to get into the stories of some of the families. We'll start with the, uh, Samuel Rosenberg, born in uh, Poland in 1855. Um, this quote is really quite interesting, the lone wolf in Moose Meadow. <laughs> He's the first to settle here. He arrives alone in 1890. Um, his wife will follow um, and, and children two years later. That's the boat that he traveled over on. Um, he left from Hamburg to New York, and uh, it's quite a, quite a journey. Um, he settles his first farm in Stafford Springs, um, renting it for $30 a year. Can you imagine that? And apparently it wasn't really close to much, uh, much of anything else, as you can see here. The farm was so far off the beaten track that only three teams of horses passed this farm in an entire year. Oh. So it gives you a... Not much confidence. No. But, you know, I, I mean, I guess if you, if you pass through the experience of living in the Pale, you would it quite enjoy... I used to live with neighbors for miles. For miles. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's a thing. You wave to every car. Yeah. <laughs> or in this case, every might be related. <laughs> yeah. Um, he then moves on to potatoes. Um, and at this point, he also founds the Jewish Farmers Association after hearing, and this is important too, is that these guys aren't, yes, he might be secluded in some seclusion, but he's looking around at the community and trying to figure out how can I make it better and how can I help others. So he finds the, founds the uh, Jewish Farmers Association in 1914 after hearing reports that Jewish farmers are being charged $250 for a bushel of seed corn in Hartford, which is twice the rate going rate. So these guys are not just saying, okay, I'm here, I'm going to do my thing and, and settle, but they're looking around and saying, look, we got to make this community better for everyone. Um, he opens a third farm, a tobacco farm, in the, on the South Windsor Line, and then in 1834, he uh, passes away. Basically, what we're doing is setting up that these partnerships, people are coming together, building community, and working together to, to really establish their roots. And Aaron Dobkin, he's very interesting because he is a sawmill owner, uh, owner in the... All right, now I did write this down. Does anyone know how to pronounce this? He's a real slav. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But look at what happens in this town. There are 37 pogroms that happen. So again, those are those Holocaust moments that are happening. Pogrom. Pogrom. Po what did I say? Pogrom. 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 Uh -huh. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, killing over 285 people. And when you think about populations back then, that's a significant portion of the population. At age 36, he arrives in, in, um, in, in the United States. And this is the ship that he arrived in. He, he traveled out of uh, Liverpool. If anyone's interested, this ship does get changed over to an aircraft carrier in World War One, and in World War One, just a funny story, it does sink. Unfortunately, the Royal Navy, which um, it has a, a famous reputation, they probably don't want to talk about that ship because it's a, one of their own ships that hits that ship and sinks it. So, um, but early aircraft carrier, it, it's hard to imagine what that looks like, but. A little bit of a uh, British historian on the, on the side. So what is interesting is we actually have his naturalization papers. And this guy, it, this is really cool. First of all, it's signed by uh, William Pitney, Pitney. And if you see up here, he has to disavow. It's right here, uh, Nicholas II, the uh, emperor of all the Russians. So just kind of an interesting little like artifact on history, uh, especially because of who Nicholas is. Um, so his he actually comes over with some money. So it's not that these like not all these people are coming over destitute anymore. He has money when he comes over. Um, his actually intended destination is Canada. Um, when he's here, he's delighted to find that there are other Jewish people in the community. So it's not just 
he alone. He's not the lone wolf in Moose Meadow anymore. There's other Jewish people um, in the community. And he, um, through, through basically through um, purchases, he, he, he basically is one of the, he has a number of starts and stops. And then he ultimately lands um, with, um, and he actually wants to leave, leave Ellington, but others say, no, 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 stay and, 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 and keep your roots here because others are going to be coming to, to Ellington. So he purchases through the, uh, the Jewish Agriculture Society, uh, a 16 room farmhouse in Ann Farm in Ellington. So you can see again, this deepening of roots um, in the community. And as Steve mentioned, the Dobkin Levine family, this is such a, to me, these are moments that I love at working at the Ellington Historical Society when you can just take a step back and look in time and see what a beautiful family they have. Um, and just think about where all the possibilities now that are available to these people because they're no longer in Central Europe. Um, here is one of the, this is, this is a, this is a quote from Audrey Dofkin, who is the granddaughter of Aaron. And this just really gives you a sense of what they were starting to experience in Ellington as, uh, as a Jewish, um, Jewish family. And I just, we'll start at the bottom. Ellington was a very small town. We found our friends on common ground other than race and religion. So you're starting to see this, this idea that they're just, they're just neighbors. And so at the top, I'll read you the quote. Um, my grandparents were Orthodox Jew Jews who followed all of the familiar traditions, yet as newcomers to the new land, when their children were invited to church services on Sunday and holiday dinners at the home of Christian neighbor or uh, neighbor, the invitations were graciously accepted and in return, many non-Jewish friends joined us at Passover, at Sadar, at Seder. On Hanukkah, Seder, at um, Hanukkah celebrations. So it's just like a really nice way of saying, look, this community is opening its arms to each other and sharing its religious traditions that were really sacred to each of these, uh, each of the religions. So again, what we're trying to show here is that it starts not as just individuals coming, but again, a community is starting to grow. And to that point, um, the next gentleman that uh, I'll be show, talking about is Joseph Berman. He was born in 1875 in anyone? Right. <laughs> It's a vacation destination. At the end of this, we'll be doing a raffle for a, a round trip vacation too. Um, so this is the ship that he arrived on um, with his children and his wife. Um, they arrive in at Ellington and with about eight eight hundred dollars. And again, we see Samuel Becker is the gentleman that helps settle them. Um, this is kind of this is a this is really interesting. So. Does it farming, as we all know, living in this community is not a surefire bet, and so that's exactly what we start to see with these guys. So they, they're getting this training and exposure to it when they're when they they link up with the Jewish uh, the Jewish Aid Society, but once they're here, it's not going to just turn around. They're going to have great the great farms that we know and we talk about today. So he's making mistakes. He reaches out to his father and much like what my dad is probably used to me saying, hey, thank you, yeah. um, and ask for more help and, and money. So basically what happens is his father gives him a loan, his brother, Abram, and his family arrive in 1906. And then if you look up to the corner here, both Joseph and his brother, Abram, go to the first ever Jewish Farmers of America's Agricultural Fair in New York City in 1909, and they win the silver 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 medal um, for their uh, for their to growing tobacco, barley, and millet. Is that how you pronounce millet. that? Okay, and that's actually a photo from that 1909 um, event. It's very cool. to me. That's like a really cool moment. There. Um, his parents then arrive um, uh, in 1912, and this is their family. Um, he is listed in Ellington's taxable list as one of the fourth richest men in the town mm -hmm. by 19, uh, uh, what's 1916. Mm -hmm. 
it doesn't necessarily, again, doesn't end necessarily well with him. He goes through ups and downs, and by the end of end of it, he's he's he ends up working for somebody else, and, and some of his family fortune is gone. So, but this is taken at that moment of like success, and you can see what a what an incredible, beautiful family that he certainly had. Mm. Joseph Cohen is our next, um, and he is quite. We have a, quite a bit of research on Joseph Cohen that we can, we're going to share tonight, today, um, and a lot of it is thanks to to mm -hmm. Diane and the work that she did by um, interviewing Sandy Cohen. Um, I'm going to set the story through the interviews that um, Diane did with Joseph Cohen, just to give you a sense of who this man was. Um, and these are the words from Sandy, um, the grandson. My grandfather wrote up, so his grand, Sandy Cohen was, was living in, in basically Moldova, Russia, back in the day, and he worked at a hospital, okay? Mm -hmm. And he's basically, he's ed educated both medicine and accounting. And so, so what happens is this. My grandfather wrote a letter to the government in Moscow complaining of the deplorable conditions at the hospital where he worked. He apparently pushed the wrong buttons. He was called to the hospital administrator who, with the letter in hand, asked him if he wrote the letter. Although my grandfather had beautiful and unique handwriting that could not be mistaken, he had adamantly denied writing the letter. On his way out, he was warned that the Tsar's secret police would be coming for him. So he decided to get out of Dodge. <laughs> so, so what Sandy, so what Joseph does next is, and we're going to be talking about this individual, uh, Max Lavitt. He, he has a relative, Max Lavitt, who's in Virginia, and I won't ruin the Max Lavitt story yet. Well, I don't ruin it, but I won't tell you this Max Lavitt story. Just know that he's established in, in Virginia, and so uh, Joseph goes to Virginia to work for him. What's interesting there is that while in Virginia, he gets malaria, and so they send him north to recover to the town of Ellington. Um, and here's a little bit more about the story. So then, uh, this is again Sandy, Sandy's description from his interview. My grandpa, for, so he meets, at that time, he meets Anne. Um, and this is the story about them. My grandfather, my grandparents were married in Ellington in 1909 and were going back to Norfolk to live. On their way back, they stopped in New York City to pick up my grandmother's belongings. And that would be Joseph's wife. Um, and, at, at that were at the boarding house where she lived while working in a garment factory. So she was working in New York City. She failed to tell my grandfather that she had back payments due on the room and board because of a factory strike. They had to, so what they did, and this is amazing, is they had to hawk her wedding ring in order to get, to get their belongings back. So <laughs> what, a, what an interesting, here's this newlywed couple that is uh, like, but they're doing the right thing. Right? They're not just saying, all right, let's just leave it and let's go. Let's get out of Dodge again. <laughs> let's, let, they did the right thing. Um, so we just think that this, this family is really interesting. As we continue, so he becomes a farmer. Um, and basically, he goes through a few different farms. He, so they, they go down to Virginia, and then malaria comes back, so he ends up back in Ellington. Um, we're going to get to this farm in a second, but basically there, he goes through basically a, a couple different farms. Um, he, he has partners that, um, he buys a farm on Penny Street in Ellington. Um, and that doesn't, it doesn't necessarily work out, but what's really interesting is that because they were unfamiliar with the climate in Ellington, they didn't cut enough firewood for <laughs> for the winter months so they ended up resorting to burning their own furniture which is just like like but you know what it's also industrious if, if if i if i look at that i'm like that's pretty cool these people are just they're gonna make it like and that's what the these people are a little bit you have to think about it those boats that we share showed you earlier are not they are not the cruise ships that we're used to today. So they've already experienced a lot to get to where, where they've been. So um, basically, um, what's cool about this is that in 1915, he purchases this farm on Frog Hollow. And this is the actual deed from the farm. And if you 
look, they like this is kind of interesting. Two horses named Dick. <laughs> two cows. If you look at the fourth bullet, now we're in a farming town, so you all should know what that what uh, show it is. Does everyone know? Yes. yes. I'm not from Ireland. <laughs> and you're from yes, Ireland. Like Iowa. <laughs> Iowa. Okay, great. So we thought that that was uh, that was like really fun when we were looking at that because some some of us were like, wait, what is that? So very specific what came with this farm. Um, and I just want to close out with um, a couple other points on this because this is where the story gets really fun about Joseph Cohen. Okay, so and I'm going to be quoting from Diane's. Uh, there's a great, if you ever go to the Ellington Farmer's Market, there's the story of the Cohens there. And I would highly recommend reading it because it's, 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 it's quite fun and it's very interesting. But um, Joseph Cohen, like most farmers of the time, were subsistence farmers. So they were growing tobacco, potatoes for cash crops. And then the, most of the family needs were grown on the farm with cash being used to purchase items like sugar, coffee, tea, flour, and spices. In 1947, um, several things happened to, to this family that becomes a huge change in the direction of their, their farming. And it's basically that their, their tobacco crops suffers from a mold and their last workhorse dies. Okay, so now you're, imagine if you will, you're sitting down at the table saying, what do I do, I'm Joseph Cohen. And he looks over at his wife, and this is what's going on with Anne. So he sits down with Anne, who has raised 500 chickens for the past several years, and has discovered that she has brought in more money with her chickens than he did with his horses and his hired men. So as you can imagine, once again, I'm getting out of Dodge, and in this case, the tobacco business, and I'm getting into the chicken business. So... Um, so that was the end of their, uh, their row farming and the beginning of their chicken farming. Um, another interesting story about uh, Joseph that is, is in this as well is that I, I'm not sure if you all know, but there used to be a trolley that um, came through this town, um, about here, over there. And he was the uh, secretary treasurer of the Federal uh, Land Bank in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and he would take the trolley. He would take the trolley um, from the bottom of Frog Hollow Road to Springfield when he needed to work at the bank. I just I like mm. it's just such a cool little story about time mm. time forgotten. But that's how people got around back then. Um, so he's just a, he's a, such a fun character. And you know the other thing that you're going to hear is a, a theme. The the, the wives of these uh, these gentlemen that we've talked about are really, in some cases, the unsung heroes. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a great story about this, uh, the, the Cohen family, and then we'll be sharing a story about the Freedmans as well that have uh, just an equally amazing story about the women as partners, because it truly is a partnership um, with these families. So moving on, we're at 1913 now, and we have... We're, we're looking at Ellington, let's say, from, from above. And all these little black dots here are showing, showing you that there are 22 farms. Mm -hmm. So 22 Jewish families now are established in, in our town, and they're making a living. Some will be successful, others won't. But it's not just about uh, getting settling, but it's also, sorry, um, they, in 1909, they, they um, get, get the rights to land. So now they have a cemetery. So not only are they settling down, but they're, they're staying for eternity here in, in this community. So it really is now their home. Um, on top of that, in 1913, so the synagogue. Mm -hmm. um, now, what's interesting is it's not in the location that it, was, it, that it is today. So it moves, and I'll, I'll tell you about that yeah. later. But, um, so, but it, it, it just, it, and this is a great Hartford uh, current headline from December 25th, 1914, that's basically saying, look, Jew will settlement in Ellington, and I would rather change that headline to just say, Jew, Jewish, Jewish people are settling in, 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 in Ellington, because that's really what's happening at this point. 22, 22 farms, a cemetery, a synagogue, uh, 
as as Steve mentioned, the Constitution. And the great thing about the Constitution, and, and Steve mentioned this, but I'll just share with you, is that they're not forgetting those who, who are still in Europe. And they, they put, there's no words to describe what Russia has done to the Jews. Um, and they're really, they're, they're not forgetting those who are still in this horrible situation in Europe. One of the things that I, I didn't mention, so war is going on. And one of the things that the Russians do, which is just horrific, is that they, what, what they do to the Jewish people is they put them in mandatory service for 20 years with the objective of just wiping out the Jew, Jewish side of their lives. So if you think about it, now World, World War I is underway, and so Jews that are in the Tsar's army are, they, the intent is not, it's not about protecting Mother Russia. It's really about stripping them of their heritage. And so we have again. So we have the we have twenty two farms. We have we have a cemetery. We have a synagogue, and we have a constitution. So what else do we need? And along comes. I'm so sorry. I wish I could. I don't know if it was pronunciation. I have, I, I have worked with Steve. Please, no. I have worked with Steve on this pronunciation like for, for at least. So I should. Yes. So, yeah. So I could say Jacob Core, but, um, <laughs> but anyways, so one of the things that we w w arrives um, in 1905, so we're, we're still dealing with around the same time, so set or so, so Shet or arrives. Um, and along with him, and, and we're going to, we're going to tell a story, a story about um, his family as well. His, his parents arrive and, and his father's a rabbi. And now we're, we're seeing marriages happen in, town, in the town. He, uh, his father presides over 12 weddings. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. And so Jacob is the, our first Sosat. Sasha. <laughs> and along comes probably one of the most famous uh, of the Corps, Samuel Kor. And we have some great stories on him. Um, so. Jacob funds Sam to come over. Does anyone ever remember? It's him. This is Mark. He's in the picture. You're in the picture. Okay. This is so. So he. This is such an awesome photo. And can I just ask you a question about it since you're in the photo? What I love about this is you all look really closely. So these are little boys coming over to get a free, uh, free. And look what they've arrived in. Did you all arrive in little? Uh, Little big wheels that are, are are farmers farmers trucks. That's what this these are like tractors. It's such a great photo, and uh, so he's he's he stays out and he's handing out the treats. Um, so he's the uh, he's the he's the butcher, and he he where is he? Right on. Uh, right where the um, Baptist churches. Yeah, oh. that's where her house was. Where the. Baptist churches go. So this guy was a character, okay? And I'm going to read to you from this article. I don't expect you to read this. I'm going to take two quotes from it that are just great. So this is an article. After he's retired, he continued to just do some of his it's some work out of his house. And um, so this is him. Just look at he's got his big cigar. He's got a he's got a he's just reads. <laughs> Character. So this is how he describes himself and kind of how he settled in Ellington. I was a good worker, strong like a horse. <laughs> uh, when I describe that myself to my wife, she does not buy it. So, <laughs> so but I, looking at him, I think he could sell that well, Sam says. And then the Hartford Current goes on. He says he couldn't speak English, but he, he knew both Polish and German. And the, later, the latter helped him, especially with the Swiss people who lived there. The Swiss people he described were good people, and I still have a lot of Swiss Swiss customers. But what's really sweet about this photo here with the, the young children, and you'll you'll appreciate this, is that in this article, his wife is asked to describe why does he why does he not want to retire? And so this is what the article goes on to say is that when somebody asks his wife Minnie why he doesn't retire, she doesn't answer. She merely shows a picture of Sam with some of his customers' children. 
Everyone is laughing, but Sam, behind his big brown cigar, which you see there, is laughing the hardest. So just know this, you brought a lot of joy to this man's life. And uh, it sounds like he was like one of these people that he would just be great to have here with us today. Um, but we again, to get, we used to get hamburg ground there at this little hamburg shop, yeah. shop, and I think there was cigar ashes in the hamburg. <laughs> <laughs> and the vaporing was full of blood. <laughs> So he's left a, like a, uh, a very memorable mark on this community. Um, what a great, what a great guy. I wish my kids could have met a guy like him. Um, and it's just sweet that, it's sweet that the real drive is that he, like this future young generation still like could appreciate, like he wanted to give back to the younger generation. So, all right, are you ready for Max Lavitt next? This guy, what? I don't know what to say except for wow. He is, he's, he's seen right, um, the Max Lavitt right above in the, uh, let's say brown jacket. This, this gentleman is incredible. So they all are, so please say that. But he comes over very young to Norfolk, Virginia. And he, he is, uh, what, he's 15 years old, right, Steve? Yeah. So 15 years old and he's, and he sets up a grocery store in the alleyways between these large mansions. And what he realizes is that the hired hands <laughs> use these alleyway, alleyways to get back and forth. So he has a grocery store there where he's then selling the products to the hired hands that are servicing the wealthy in these um, mansions. And that's where Joe Cohen comes over to work with him. So this guy, he is, he's just, as Steven said, he wasn't about retail, he was about wholesale. So this is like, he's always thinking at a higher scale. Um, I love this too, Max, big, thinking big. Um, and so somehow he ends up in Ellington. Our hunch is, is that when Joe Cohen goes to Ellington, he tells him about the tobacco opportunity there. Um, I don't have specific, like a diary that says that, but he ends up coming to um, Ellington and he has a huge uh, tobacco warehouse here. He buys big, as we say, on Maple Street. And uh, this is just a cool photo too. Look at that car, if anything. Um, but this guy, young, young, and he's so instrumental in bringing more family members over, thinking, as, as we say, thinking big and um, growing the community. And thinking big, just look at this family here, 1932. Yeah, there is in the middle too. I mean, guy, 15 years old to then have a family settled in in our community, and again, I, I just I can't stop thinking about this. But 1930, sorry, um, 1932, things are about to get really bad back in the home countries for a lot of these people. So, um, so it's amazing. So we're going to move on to just a few more. I know that we're almost at time, so I won't. I, I don't want to rush, rush because each of these families again deserve a uh, des deserve their time in the in the spotlight. But Hyman Rochelle, uh, he's a very interesting character because I shouldn't say because he he he's from Ukraine, and his his path to Ellington doesn't go Europe to New York. It's actually Europe to Argentina. And um, he's, mm. he's trained in Argentina to do farming. So he's using the resources that are, um, are available to him to start to learn about farming. So by the time he gets to Buenos Aires, he's saying, I'm ready to, I'm ready to do this. And then he, a year later, he's like, I'm not sure if I want to stay here. You, uh, the next year, he's like, I definitely don't want to stay here. And the third year, he's like, I got to get out of Dodge. And so. <laughs> Once again, this, this, uh, this, uh, so he leaves and he comes to Ellington. He doesn't like uh, South America, comes to Ellington in 1922, and he eventually owns one of the largest chicken farms in, in Connecticut. A little bit more on him. Um, so they purchase a 145 acre farm, um, broadleaf tobacco, some dairy cow, uh, cows in Ellington in the 1930s, a hurricane destroys his sheds and equipment. Um, 
but they get some, they obtain government get uh, mm -hmm. grant to rebuild their farms. Um, gives up tobacco and dairy farming, and they build a successful chicken business, and that's the largest chicken, uh, largest in Connecticut with 25,000 chickens, mm -hmm. selling his land in 1860. Yeah. One of the interesting things is you've got tobacco, and you also have this crazy story about chickens in, in our town too. Chickens, uh, uh, as we've seen from the Cohens, now we see from Rochelle, is the same thing. This is their, this is their original homestead, um, and that's it today. So you can still see that, um, the house that they lived in. Um, now, Diane, can you help me with this story again, the Baird farm? Okay, so, yeah. So, Rachel's son-in-law is a Baron. Rachel, son-in-law is a Baron. And, the bear, and they bought a farm on Frog Hollow, which is where John and Angie Moser live now. Okay. And they still sell a few chickens there. But um, <laughs> Hyman, that was his... He always Hyman lived to, in his 90s, and he always visited this farm. So, the, his daughter and son-in-law started another chicken farm on Frog Hollow, and that house is there today. Mm. And Rochelle the was on Sign Road. Had, yeah, but this is a yeah. this is a yeah a, a song a different song. Right. So we will be uh, so one of the last stories that we'll be sharing, and we have a relative of Max Friedman here in the uh, in the audience with us today is the Friedman family. Um, they are. Uh, does anyone know who the Friedmans are today? Who? But, one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Sarah, do we does uh, does this? Yes. And once again, since we're, uh, I'm just moving a little fast because we're, we're almost at time here. This is an amazing story. It's your grand, grandmother, correct? Um, so, so once again, if you read, uh, this is actually from the Superior Energies website. They, they, they carry their history forward through, through their, through their um, company, which is great. Here is Sarah Freeman, Max's wife. Um, back in the day when roads were just were still just made of dirt, and a trip to the closest big city of Springfield, Massachusetts, would take an entire day. Sarah <laughs> sought closer uh, closer propane gas resources to keep baby what chickens. <laughs> Here we go again on the family farm warm. She saw an opportunity and decided to buy in bulk on her next trip to sell the excess to other local farmers and from that point superior was born and what's so cool about this again is you see industrious women yes. in our community establishing businesses looking looking beyond um uh, and so we will just I, I know that again we have like three minutes so I'm, i apologize we have the good news is i only have 17 more slides I'm just <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so when we when we kind of look at the the story of Ellington, we had that 1913 moment where we, we had the 22 farms, and we have a lot uh, a lot of moments. 1928, we see a lot of big big changes happening. Obviously, the depression is one of them. We have um, Labitz, uh, Labitz has a fire, the bankruptcies that happen, and there's somewhat of a change in the type of farming that's happening. Tobacco, there's challenges with tobacco, poultry, potatoes, and then we have World War II. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop the resilience of this community, okay? And so you think, okay, did they all just say, you know what, enough is enough. And I forgot to mention this early on, because this is a, this is a really an interesting point. Why did in the early 1900s, and I'm sorry to go all the way back to that, but it's an important thing. Why was Becker able to look around this community and start to say, you, you know, there's available farmland? Well, what was interesting is that at the turn of the century, a lot of the Yankee farmers, let's call them for the lack of a better word, were their sons and daughters didn't want to stay on the farm. They were looking to the expansion to the big cities. Here, what you see is by 1955, we have 68 farms. Okay, so I, I did the I did some interesting just math just to just close this because I think this is really a good thing. But when I showed you 1913, that was, there's a 42 year gap between 1913 and 1955, right? And in that 42 year gap, we saw 46 more farms come into the community. Mm -hmm. So talk again, as we said, like the, everything that was, what was happening in the community was growing those roots and deepening those roots. And as we know, 
there there are still three families in this community today and superior gas is uh, has a, gr a great story here's a list of over we have the 73 indiv uh, individual families that we can we we can trace to the Ellington community um, I mentioned this earlier the synagogue which uh, was moved um, in 1954 to its present location the building is listed on the National Registry of Historic Places um, and then some of the some of the people that did like, uh, for example, the Cohen, uh, the David Cohen, who has a great story as well. And let me tell you it really briefly. So David Cohen is Joseph's uh, youngest son. He graduates high school at the age of 15 and is accepted into Brown University. Unfortunately, he can't attend it until he's 18 years old. Unfortunately, again, <laughs> in eight, when, by the time he turns 18, the depression is hit and they can't afford to send him to Brown. So um, what ends up happening is he, uh, he, he leaves town, he goes, to, uh, works in Hartford at some factories, and then he comes home. Um, he once again turns to chickens and uh, he, he has a chicken farm that at one time had 10 to 11,000 chickens on the farm. And he had five to six thousands of, of those chickens laying eggs, eggs at, uh, at a time. Can you imagine that? And so he was very successful. Um, and the, their chickens were actually known um, to be bigger than average uh, the, the, the average laying hens. So they did really well at auction when he went to sell, sell them for meat. So that's his story. The Cohen farm expands in the... Uh, at, at, at this time, so these are some photos of the expansion. And then it, today, uh, Sandy and Harris Cohen's farm on 81 Falcala Road. And our final story is the Silver Hertz farm. So basically what's interesting about this, in 2010, this farm um, was, uh, it was acquired um, by the state of Connecticut in the town of Ellington, okay? And the acquisition, um, so this is a Hartford Current article from from what what is what is going on with this the acquisition rights to develop the to write the, uh, the acquisition and development rights of this 119 acre Silverhertz farm property on Penny Street by the town and state has been completed this is the article from 9 to, uh, 2010 the preservation of the farm is Ellington's first joint acquisition with the state and the federal and ranch lands protection program by um, and and this is run by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The farm is now placed on a permanent conservation easement, restricting its use to agriculture and preventing residential development and subdivision. Protect the, the protected farms helps the town and the state retain its rural character, its scenic vistas, protecting natural resources, promoting local food security, and sustaining the employment of the agricultural sector. And I close with that. Because what's, what's really cool about the Jewish heritage in this town is now you think about it, it's preserving the heritage of this town in general. It's preserving the agricultural character by having this now on the National Registry. So um, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. I wish we had more time. I, I apologize if we rushed towards the end. These are great stories. I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. There's a lot more that you can do. There's some great um, resources out there. Um, and we're working on our own book. Well, our great author, Steve, the, uh, the, the researcher extraordinaire is working on a book and on, on this Jew the Jewish story. And um, I just want to thank you all for coming out today. Can't, we couldn't have done this without the help of many of the families who reached out and asked for stories and share it. And if you would like to send us more stories or raise your hand and say, oh, I want to share a story about, about Aaron with us or, or, or Joseph, please let us know and we'd be happy to sit down and talk with you. So thank you for your time today. And